Obviously, I had this question last night from Dr. Lord. Um, very briefly, I'm going to spend just four or three minutes. Uh, good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church. If you're a guest this morning, we're glad to have you here. And thank you all for being here for the first time. We believe we have a, a gift for you in the back after the service is over there in the office. Have you ever wondered what, it, to better understand the most difficult book in the Bible, Revelation? We're going to be meeting on Wednesday at 10 a.m. starting on February 24th. We start the Bible meeting. We study the Bible using the book Agents of the Apocalypse by Dr. David Jeremiah. Study guides will be given out with the book cost $13.99. Time to the office if it's inter- if you're interested. And I think Brooke Eva, I think Brooke Eva is going to teach next. Right. Okay. One other thing. Want to stay informed and get your next news about FBC? And what you need to do is to contact the office by your email. FBC office at fbcdavidson.org and tell them you want to be on the list to do the forum of all the things that are happening. And that's all I got. So now there's going to be more updates. We're going to talk about the Super Bowl. Thank you. It's great to see you all here today. Hey, uh, we are going to talk about the Super Bowl, and this is it. We're inviting you to come over to the house tonight. Six o'clock we're beginning. The game starts at 6.30, as I understand. And, uh, and this is the thing, okay? We're going to be rooting against Brady, okay? That's, that's the house rule. But hey, I'm not, I'm not against senior citizens, but, you know, I, I, just, I just never have liked Brady. So, uh, you know, cheat gate and all that, uh, inflate gate and all that stuff, you know what I'm talking about. It just seems like that he's always been on the edge. Of course, he might be a really nice guy. I don't know. But you got to be against someone, right? So, uh, anyway... I'm shooting for uh, Kansas City tonight, and you can be for whoever you'd like, okay? You're welcome to come over. Just come on over to the house, 6 o'clock, and we'll have us a fun time. We've got room upstairs, downstairs, and the game will be on both levels. 
Now, if you're not into football, that's all right, okay? We, we, you, you can bring table games. We, we've got other games there, and uh, we've got table space available, so come on down, and we'll just have us a fun time. You can play your stuff. I'll watch the game, and uh, we've got food, and so just come on out. It's going to be a good time, all righty? If you would like to sign up for that, just so we know um, what to expect as far as food, the sign-up sheets are in, on, on the back uh, in the Welcome Center. So just go ahead and sign up on that as you as you leave today, and that will let us know what to expect tonight, okay? So uh, you're all welcome. Even if you don't sign up today and you say, well, you know, I would like to go, but I didn't sign up, you're welcome. Come on down, okay? We're just, we're just happy to have you. So the more the merrier. We've got room, and we'd love to have you. Okay, you ready? Yeah. All righty. <laughs> Go Chiefs. Okay, you ready? If you're, if you're worthy for Tampa Bay to say that you never mind the Chiefs score, they always lose. <laughs> I do have that tendency. I do have the tendency to pick the loser. Hey. What? Oh, no, I, I wasn't. I was But you can take that personally if you'd like. It's up to you, but no, I... Uh, you know, just just my my Super Bowl picks. I don't bet on games. The reason is I'd be I I would have to ask for a loan. <laughs> I'd be poor uh, because I'm a loser when it comes to picking games. So it's very likely that Brady will win tonight. Oh well, the 49ers aren't playing, so it really doesn't matter, right? All right, we're gonna eat anyway. Come on down. We're gonna have, gonna have a good time. Let's get to worshiping, okay? That's what we're here for. Let's stand as we sing. celebrate communion. We do this monthly. I hope it's not for you just another thing. I hope that as you focus today on the, on the words of the songs, as we, as we look at, again, what God has done for us through his son, Jesus, I hope that uh, this will be a special time for you as you recall what the Lord has done in uh, providing for you forgiveness grace, mercy, salvation. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for uh, this moment that we can come and worship you. Lord, help us to, uh, to push away the things of this world, to push away the, the stuff that could get in the way. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to focus only on you, to let you be the center our attention. May this worship time bring you glory and praise. And may the, the things that we remember today, may they remind us again and again of your love, your grace, your mercy. 
We celebrate who you are. It is our purpose in worship. In Jesus' name. All right, we did this a while back, and remember when we get to the chorus, we gotta do it again. Okay, here we go. Oh. 
thank you that we can praise your holy name. The Bible says that you are holy, holy, and holy. And God, we just thank you for all that you are. Um, Lord, we also know that there are many out there who don't know your name. And for their sake, Lord, we just pray that this service will reach them, that your message will reach them. Um, God, we want them to have the same assurance that we have, the assurance that we get to spend eternity with you and your love and in your grace. So, Heavenly Father, um, please just be with us as we worship. Help that to be a glory to you. And in the sweet name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
So, folks, we've got it all this morning. We've got, we've got uh, a band. We've got hymns. We've got a choir. Hey, you know, we got it all going on. It's definitely a combination. It's a combination that seems to work, though. So, uh, grateful for that. I've heard from people during the week who are just worn out with this pandemic stuff. You might be one of those. Don't know, but you might be one of those. I, I wonder, I wonder about what will come out of this pandemic. How will this experience change us? I preach about this because I think that it's wise for us to, to talk about the things that are happening with us and to us as it relates to the Bible and what God expects of us. I've discovered in going through previous difficulties this one thing. Times like these usually cause people's weaknesses to rise to the surface. If you want to know what people are made of, just add a little stress. It's just that way. Stress always brings out the quality. The same thing for, you know, I mean, working with metal or whatever, if you've got a weakness in the metal, all you have to do is add a little stress and break there it is. The weakness, whatever it is, becomes amplified and more prominent. So what was societal's major weakness before the pandemic? I would say to you that the thing that's most disturbing to me, the weakness that I see in our society is this, relational breakdown. Do you understand what I'm saying today about relational breakdown? It doesn't seem like people are in relationship as maybe they once were. We seem to have gotten a little weak in this area. We saw many people who had become relationally separated. While they might have known social facts about people, people that they associate with, they really don't know people in their, in their circle intimately. They just, know, they just know about them. What ought to be relational has become mechanical and not very personal. The Facebook reminder pops up. 
on my phone. Back when I was on Facebook, I have decided in my own life that I am freer without Facebook. So this is what's going to happen. When it's Mike's birthday, you're not going to know it. You got that? You know why, don't you? Because you probably wouldn't have known that it's Mark's birthday unless it popped up on your phone. And there you, you take your phone out and you say, well, look at there, it's Mark's birthday. Well, I'll send him a text. And you send him a text, you say, oh, we celebrated Mark's birthday with him, you know? I got, yeah, I sent the text, I got it. Along with hundreds of people maybe sending him, happy birthday, Mark, well done, Mark, you made it to 30 or whatever, you know, whatever the thing may be. But, but this is it. With a digital message, I convince myself that I've con connected with that person but have I? Have I? If this form of, of social connection fits you and it's a meaningful thing for you, it is very likely that uh, you might just fully embrace what's coming next. Watch this. Turn it up if you would, Dean. Now with only the end of Adam and Eve robot, demands to produce thousands of robots by the end of 2021. I am an artificial intelligence. You might like to become an artificial intelligence. Hong Kong-based Hanson Robotics says four models, including Sophia, will start rolling out of factories by the first half of 2021. The company's founder and CEO, David Hanson. We are just now mass producing Sophia. This is Sophia number 24, and many of my previous robots uh, were hand built. However, now we have begun scaling the manufacturing of Sophia so we can make hundreds and into thousands of units of Sophia and use this also as the foundation for many other kinds of characters. How did you feel when? Um, they created her to promote human-to-machine empathy and compassion. She's appeared on late-night shows and the cover of fashion magazines. Sophia was even given legal citizenship in Saudi Arabia and appointed the UN's first non-human innovation champion. Her new role is in the healthcare sector, taking temperatures with a thermal camera on her chest or leading morning exercise with the elderly. Social robots like me can help take care of the sick or elderly in many kinds of healthcare and medical uses. I can help communicate, give therapy, and provide social stimulation, even in difficult situations. Researchers predict the fallout from global lockdowns will open new opportunities for the robotics industry. Good. So they emulate the human form and figure and interaction. Um, and then that can be so useful during these times where people are terribly lonely and socially isolated. And people need to be isolated from each other um, uh, because to be around people is dangerous these days. But these robots can keep people safe from danger while still providing that kind of human warmth, that human connection as a telepresence device and also as autonomous uh, extension of human expertise. Hanson Robotics is launching a new robot this year called Grace developed specifically for healthcare. Other big players in the industry are also taking note. SoftBank Robotics' Pepper Robot was deployed to detect people who weren't wearing masks. In China, robotics company Cloud Minds helped set up a robot-run field hospital in Wuhan. Worldwide sales of professional service robots had already jumped 32% to $12.2 billion between 2018 and 2019 according to the International Federation of Robotics. Uh, my forecast for 2021 would be selling into thousands of robots, both large and small, uh, and helping people in education uh, and healthcare, uh, and um, really hopefully touching the hearts of people to inspire them for a future where machines might uh, become our friends, our true friends. They might become alive. And I think that that relationship becomes really important. 2021, I think, is the beginning of a very positive future. High five. 
I want to make a difference in the world by teaching people about new technologies. I am hoping that through my work, kindness and tolerance will win out over ignorance and impatience. That's freaky, huh? Hey, I don't know about you, but the attempt at emotion there, the attempt at emotion. I mean, when you see a robot coming up to you going, you can just know that they're going to have a knife too, you know? Uh, you know, that looks like some scary movie, doesn't it? The emotion, the emotion in robots. Hmm. Sophia, Sophia. The creator of Sophia says to us, to be around people is dangerous these days. Is that a stretch? Is that a lie? Is it dangerous for me to be here today with you? No. No. Mask or otherwise, it is not dangerous. It is not dangerous. You see, we're being told things to manipulate us, and he's wanting to sell robots. So it's dangerous for these, these days for us to be around each other. And then he says, my hope is that these machines will touch the hearts of people to become true friends. Friends who are alive in our relationships. Wow, there you go. That, that's it. You see, we've got this weird thing that, that, that people are trying to convince us that we can, we can change the way that God made us and everything's all right. But that's not truth. Human isolation will create a craving for relationships. It's how God made us. And I want you to understand that today. I'm not telling you anything new. I am trying to bring down to, to focus the things that God has already explained to us in his word. And his word says that we need relationships with living people. That's the way he made us. Deepening relationships are satisfying because they fit who we are and who God made us to be. To satisfy this lonely craving that we have, people will either be driven into deeper face-to-face -face human relationships or they will find something artificial to fill the void to provide a relational fix for the moment. And sometimes that's drugs, sometimes that's alcohol, sometimes that's sexual stuff, sometimes you can just name it and there it is. Something to fill the void of a deepening relationship with another person. To know which way people will choose to go is unknown right now, but we soon will. There is coming a tsunami, a large thing that will come out of this pandemic. And people will be going, wow, never expected that. But when you separate people long enough, when you separate people and tell them it's dangerous to get together, there's something bad coming down the line. We see already the number of suicides in our young people. Why? Because they are the most fragile. They need social interaction. And so do adults. Because that's the way God made us. So this is where we find ourselves today. Our normal routines have been, have been messed with. They have been disrupted. And one positive, uh, one positive thing in being a part of this is that, it, that, it, that it's all around us. We have all had our routines equally disrupted. Since the pandemic is community-wide, affecting all of us at once, 
it works to our advantage because we can definitely understand and have true empathy for others, can't we? I mean, you can understand the weirdness. And you say, well, does this other person? Yes, they're experiencing that too. Since we're all in this together, we can have empathy for one another. What we crave, they also crave. The weirdness you feel is the same weirdness they feel. Your feeling of, I, I can't, well, no, more like, can't we just be done with this now? Well, that's their feeling too. But since we don't seem to be able to find a way out of this easily or quickly, we've got to find new ways to effectively reach out. As believers in Christ, we've got to find new ways to effectively reach out to people in today's environment. I want to recap some things. I've been speaking to you about this party that, uh, that, 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 that Matthew had with the tax collectors and Jesus and the Pharisees show up. I've been talking to you about that for a couple of weeks now. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking that a little further here because I think, I think we need to circle the airport spiritually on this one and just say, let's look at this one more time. Let's take another pass by this. I want you to understand what's going on here. Matthew's having a party. He's having a party with the tax collectors. The Pharisees come by and say, what are you doing? Don't you know that that's not allowed? And, and the party is where Jesus is. The party is where, where the people are. And so we're having this party with the tax collectors. The emphasis is on two things for you. First, we discovered that we are all scummies. We are all in the collection of scummies. And this is the way it is. We can call each other scummies because we know that we have sinned and sin is scummy. And the Pharisees were saying, why are you hanging around with all these scummy people? And Jesus says, because that's who I came for. I came for the scummies. See, this is what you need to understand. We have all sinned and we have a connection with everyone else. The one thing about being a sinner is this. You understand sinners. And guess what? We're all sinners. We understand each other. And we, all, we need to understand our weaknesses in that and also how that sin thing works so that you can understand all those out there that you are to connect with. And that idea that we are all sinners ought to change our attitude. It ought to change the attitude of who we are. And there should be no uppity spiritual thing going on with me or you. I mean, oh, I'm a pastor after all. I mean, I should get that voice, you know, that, that spiritual superiority. Mm -hmm. I, should, I should come around you and sort of look down on you. After all, you have not been to seminary, have you? Huh. No, you haven't. It didn't make me any better. It just made me more confused, I think, sometimes. But theology is that way at times. This is what I want you to know. There is no one better than another. I am no better than you. You and I are no better than the people out there who did not come this morning. We are all scummies. We are all sinners. And that's an important thing to learn from this story in the Bible. The second thing is this. The second emphasis that, that, we, that we had was Matthew was used as a conduit in connecting his friends with Jesus. And I want you to understand that. You are the conduit. You are the way that other people come to Jesus. It's very important for you to understand this. We are to relate to those who we have a common interest with and connect them with Jesus. Our, 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 the idea here is that we're supposed to use the path of least resistance. 
And you see, the path of least resistance for me is I find something that I have in common with others, and I connect with them about that and ultimately have a chance to influence them as they see and they hear about my life with Jesus. This is the way it works. And that's what was going on with Matthew and the tax collectors at that party. I want you to realize this is a God-driven thing and, a, and, a, and something we must see. So my message last week seemed to be a dis discussion starter. Right afterwards, the question started, and very good questions at that. I, I, and I said, well, you know what? We need to spend another week on this. So here we are spending another week. And here's the things that came out of that sermon last week. This is it. I understand that I am to reach out. But in today's environment, how can I do that? Good question. It's hard enough in, in normal times to do, to do the, the outreach. But here in the weird and strange days of COVID, how can we connect with people so that we can help them come one step closer to Jesus and see their lives changed? I mean, really, how can we, how can we reach out when, you know, it's so difficult? And the answer is, I don't know. I'm really glad you came today, though. So do we have a closing song, Reed? Yeah. You know, we've got those people in quarantine who have been in perpetual quarantine for a long time. Some are hiding in their, their house until they get the vaccine. I wonder what happens then. Because on my phone, it just said to me, and for some strange we reason, it was on the Weather Channel. It came up, boink. I looked at it. It's a video. And, and I was looking at it. I said, oh, my goodness. Look at there. It says, even after receiving the vaccine, you should wear a mask and social distance because it is not safe. Oh, really? Fear is keeping other people secluded. I've got a friend that I talked to this week. She lives in California. She said, I said, how are you doing? She says, I'm doing fine. And she said, I've I've been in seclusion, that's the word she used, seclusion, since March. You understand that's March of 2020. And the strange thing that she said was, it's, it's been pretty easy to adapt to this. Oh man, that's scary. That is really scary. It's almost devilish, isn't it? Almost devilish. No, it is devilish. He's the great divider. Connecting relationally with those like this seems impossible. With layers of separation in the way, it seems impossible. I'll be the first to agree that many things are working against us. But that does not change Jesus' command for us to reach out. So, this is what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to give you a few principles to remember and apply as we attempt to connect with people in the context of COVID. Principle number one, here it is. Our Christian responsibility is to be willing to connect but it's the Holy Spirit who opens the door. If God has given us a command that we are to connect with others, 
that we are to reach out to others, then God better open that door, don't you think? I mean, if he's asking us to do that, I believe that he's the one that's going to open the door. Our place is to understand the what. We know what we've been commanded to do. And we've been commanded to bring people one step closer to Jesus so that they can have their life changed. You see, one step, one step, one step, and you bringing them to Jesus and their life is changing and we can see people come to Christ that way. We know the what. We are to know that well. But this is what you need to understand. The Holy Spirit's place is to determine the when. Since this connection is for a spiritual change, the one who moves in a person's spirit must be in charge. The Holy Spirit determines the right timing. We don't. The Holy Spirit is our guide. Our place is to be sensitive and not to push where the Holy Spirit isn't moving yet. See, we are to keep in step with the Holy Spirit, the Scripture says. That doesn't mean that we get to run ahead of Him and push where He's not pushing into. So we need to keep in step with Him. The Holy Spirit uses moments of vulnerability to shock people when they find themselves out of control, when life is disrupted. Sometimes there is then an opening that wasn't there before. And I want you to know today that there are a lot of people who are walking around somewhat numb because their world has been turned upside down and they don't know quite what to do. That's where you come in. You see, the Holy Spirit gives us opportunity to speak to people when they feel vulnerable and don't know what to do. We live with expectancy, expecting doors to be opened in the lives of the people that we are to connect with. So, let the Holy Spirit open the door. Principle number two. Give your attention to those who are willing to connect with you. Don't get frustrated or impatient with those who are unwilling. You know, sometimes we put the pressure on ourselves. We really do. We all have people in our lives that we would really like to see come to Jesus. It might be a son, a daughter. It might be a relative. It might be a close friend. But we have people in our life that is, that is you know, they're, they're, they're sort of our target. We'd really like to see them come to Jesus. But sometimes we allow ourselves to have tunnel vision on them and make them the only person that we're really focused on. I want you to keep praying for them, but let them go. Just let them go. The Holy Spirit has a strange way of bringing them back around again. So we just need to wait. If you've got a son, you've got a daughter that you're really concerned about today, and you're really super worried about them, I want you to understand The Holy Spirit is working on them. Sometimes the Holy Spirit just has to do that groundwork before we get a chance to see the change. So control the things you can control. If you have not been given a chance to influence a change in the life of that one that you'd like to see come to Christ, accept it. And move on. The Holy Spirit has another one for you to deal with right now. Just know that the Holy Spirit is wanting you to keep in step with Him. 
principle number three. And you'll find that these things are all sort of wound up in each other. It is impossible for me to change someone else's heart. All I can do is change my own. It is impossible for me to change someone else's heart. All I can do is to change my own. Heart change is the is the most difficult part of the Christian life since, since it always determines what comes next. In the context of what we were talking about this morning, I want you to remember what James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18 has to say. This is what James says. Listen closely. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith with my good deeds. If I understand what Jesus has left me here to do, and I know I am to connect with people and share my, my faith with them, it changes my life's perspective. I look at things differently. My faith changes my heart from I have to to I want to. I have to is the knowledge in my head. Well, I, I know I have to share my faith with people. I know I have to connect with people. But you see, when faith really becomes faithful is when it comes to a want to. A want to. That is in my heart. Before I started talking about this topic three weeks ago, I could have done a poll. The poll question would be, how many of you know that if you're a Christian, Jesus expects you to share your faith with others? And the hands would have gone up all over the sanctuary. But the follow-up question would have been, how many of you are regularly doing it? Possibly fewer hands would have been raised on that one. What James is saying in the scripture is that there's an attitude change that moves our faith or belief into faithful action. All the biblical knowledge or the biblical knowing in the world is useless. If it doesn't motivate us into biblical doing. Do you get that? You see, the people that say, I have faith, I have faith, I have faith. But that faith doesn't produce anything in their life that makes a difference, that causes them to be different and getting to the place that Jesus wants them to be and do the things that Jesus wants them to do. All the faith in the world is useless if it doesn't produce the doing. This is where we can allow a clog in our faith plumbing. But when our attitude is changed, then we begin living our life from a new perspective and we see the people around us as those that we are to reach. Don't know for sure which one right yet, but the Holy Spirit's going to show me which one's going to rise to the surface 
And that's the one. That's the one right now that the Holy Spirit has been has given me to connect with. That's the one right there that I am able to influence. When my life perspective changes because my attitude has been changed, my prayer becomes, Lord, Lord, I'm ready. Use me. I'm ready, Lord. Open up the doors. Lead me to your next connection or lead them in here to me. One way or the other, I'm ready, Lord. Use me. I'm ready to see my faith become active in bringing people one step closer to you. You see, every one of us as believers, we know how to do this because we know how we came to Christ. And it's easy to figure out what the next step is for for the other person. Where are they? What do they need? Do they need encouragement? How can you encourage them? Do they need your help? How can you help them? What can you do in their life to make a difference to influence them for Jesus? We've got to come to the place where fear will no longer hold us back. To finally say, Lord, my faith will win over my fear. I'm ready, Lord. Use me. You see, most of the time, it's it's not that we don't have the opportunity to share our faith of what of what Jesus is doing in our life. It's commonly that we are unwilling to take the opportunities we've been given. It is impossible for me to change someone else's heart. But I certainly can change my own. Jesus said, for those who have eyes, let them see. I wonder if he was including these divine appointments or these connections in that Let them see part. Jesus said, for those who have ears, let them hear. I wonder if he was including in that this moment right now. Because it's time for decision. Are you a Lord? I'm ready. I am ready. I am ready to connect with people. I'm ready to see how I might be able to take that person that I'm connecting with just one step closer to you. I'm ready, Lord. Yeah. Or is your decision, well, I believe in Jesus. But I'm not there yet to do that connecting thing. For those who have ears, let them hear. Jesus left us here for this purpose. And this is what we must do in order to be obedient to Jesus who left us here for this purpose. To do anything else is to neglect our faith. To not have anything worked out of that. Except, sure, I believe. Belief without action, is dead. 
But faith with action is alive. The question today is, are you dead or alive? Are you willing to connect and to be the one who brings people one step closer? Those people that the Holy Spirit's going to bring around you and connect with you? Are you saying, Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, for giving your life for me. I'm not going to take that any further. Can you say today, Lord, I'm ready. Use me. Use me. Our Father, as we come to this moment of decision, I pray that you will direct us well into a hearing that moves us into faithful action. We want to really hear this morning. We want to hear. Help us to hear. Help us to have eyes to see who the connections are around us and to not let fear gain control of our actions to stop us. Help us to have ears to hear what you're saying to us today. Help us to have relationships with those who you are ready to send. As you open the door, Lord, May we be ready. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing this song this morning, it is our hope that it will help you to prepare your heart for the
Please be seated. Word of God says that uh, this in Luke. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This morning, as we come to communion again, I want to remind you of some very important, a very important thing, and, and this is it. Communion was about allowing the Father to win. It was about the Son, Jesus, submitting to the plan of God, the plan of the Father, and saying, yes, I will. Remember when he, he left communion here and he went out into the garden? Remember that scene as he, as he asked for this to pass and not go through with it, but knowing full well that he, he had to, that was the mission, but struggling with that. I think that that scene is very important because it's about lordship, you see. When we talk about lordship, it means God wins. That's all it is. God wins. Are you going to do what Jesus said? Yes, God wins. Am I going to do what Jesus said? Yes, yes, he wins. It's all about lordship. Communion is about lordship too. Not only are we remembering what Jesus did for us, what he provided for us, his broken body and his blood but he was submitting to the authority of the Father, just as we are to submit to the authority of our God. So this morning, as you take the bread, understand that this is not just eating a wafer. This is, I commit myself again to you, Lord, you are my God, and you win. Let us eat the bread today. Remember that he is the bread of life, the giver of eternal life. Eat in remembrance. As we drink the juice this morning, it is to be a remembrance of the blood that was shed for us and the forgiveness of sin. Jesus did this for you, submitting to the Father's plan. May you submit to the Father's plan as well. Lord, I'm ready. Use me. Let us drink the cup. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. And thank you, Lord, now that we remember again what you have provided for us. Thank you for paying the price that we could not pay and doing what we could not do. For you are the giver of life and eternal life. May you be praised forever and ever. We pray in Jesus Christ's name, amen. I want to thank you for coming to church today and being a part of worship. Thank you for being bold enough to come out. You, by being here, are an example to others. Well done, folks. Well done. See you next week. Have a great one.